think uh, when I finish today, you're going to see that there's a real convergence going on between biologics, which is what I deal with in my company, um, and synthetics. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of give you a, an overview of where we've been, uh, where we are, and where I think we're going. And again, this will just this is not exhaustive by any stretch. Uh, however, I do think that I've captured probably the, the big trends that are going on right now uh, in human tissue transplantation. Really, for me, the journey began in 1992 when I received um, a lower limb of a small, uh, a little girl who had had osteosarcoma in her shin bone. And it was our job as pathologists to determine whether or not that cancer had spread outside of the bone. It was completely contained. It hadn't broken through, it hadn't spread anywhere else. And so here I was dealing with this lower extremity and there was a child who's now a 30-something year old adult who does not have a lower extremity from basically the knee down. What none of us knew at the time was 1,200 miles away, there was a transplant surgeon who was taking those same cases and saving their limbs. He was determining ahead of time whether or not the cancer had spread outside of the, the bone. And if it had not, he was able to remove that section of cancerous bone and, and substitute or transplant another equivalent human bone in that area. And if he could leave the growth plates alone, there was no need for any other surgery. So while my patient is walking around with a prosthetic today, he has over 2,000 similar patients who have their lower extremities because of the work he was doing. So in the past, we were captured by regionality. I didn't even know about this guy myself, and yet he'd already been doing it for about 15 years by the time I got this specimen. Then um, there's been a tremendous amount of concern about uh, infectious disease with human transplant. And the two biggest cases I can tell you about were one HIV transmission and one hepatitis C transmission. The HIV transmission occurred in 1985 and it wasn't discovered until 1992. Two surgeons were at a similar conference to this. They bumped into each other and one of them said, hey, remember that donor we got you know, seven years ago? My patient died of HIV. And the other surgeon said, well, so did mine. And next thing you knew, they were comparing notes and doing a look back. What we found was that with the HIV case, over 40 pieces of tissue were transplanted and only three transmitted disease. When we went back and took a look at those three cases, all three of them still had live red blood cells in the allograft. There was a fourth tissue released that had live red blood cells in it. That orthopedic surgeon took the, sh I think it was femoral shaft if I'm not mistaken, took it, cored out the marrow, now think about this. this, this is the prevention that he undertook to keep from spreading HIV. Cored out the bone marrow and rinsed it with normal saline and it did not transmit HIV. Uh, in 2003, a very similar case occurred of hepatitis C. And by the way, right now, those are the two biggies, really, truly, in terms of long-term disease. 2003, there was a hepatitis C case. Again, over 40 pieces of human tissue were transplanted and only four transmitted. And again, those were uh, tissues that actually had live red blood cells in them. But the biggest, most important issue was that there, in both cases, there were samples that we could go back, archived samples, and we could run PCR tests testing on them. I call it NAT or nucleic acid testing. We were able to do HIV PCR on one and hepatitis PCR on the other. And by the way, those particular tests are not nearly as good as the ones we use now in blood banking and tissue banking. And in both cases, they both would have been positive. So in 1985 and in 2003, if we'd been using the tests we're using today, there would have never in the history of human transplantation ever been an HIV case or a hepatitis C case. CJD and mad cow disease, there has not been a transmission of CJD, by the way. The CJD is, a, is not a virus, it is not a bacterium, it's a protein in your brain and mine that we all normally have. For some reason, it can be triggered to change its shape, and somehow when it changes its shape, it develops disease, and we call it Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. A form of it was called mad cow disease. You guys all heard about that. I'm happy to say there have been no cases of mad cow disease in the United States, ever. There have been some uh, British imports that have brought it with them, but it hasn't been spread, and, it, and, it, and I, don't I don't anticipate it ever will. But we get about one out of every million Americans come down with CJD every year. 
1974, there was a transmission from corneal transplantation. And I loved how Stephen had corneas up there because that is definitely that's a, that's a hot item for curing corneal blindness in the world. And that case in 1974 was a patient with dementia. So in 1974, we simply started ruling out donors with dementia. And there hasn't been a transmission since. Now, in the, in the, um, in the first world countries, the last recorded one was in 1992, and that was in Germany. But just by simply changing our donor uh, screening criteria, we, we've been able to mitigate CJD transmission. And then, uh, it, it's hard to believe it was 10 years ago, but 10 years ago there was a guy in New Jersey that was stealing body parts. And he was uh, pretending that they were suitable for transplantation. He was making up donor charts. Uh, he was taking uh, donors that were positive for syphilis and HIV and hepatitis C and hepatitis B and just falsifying the records and releasing them. Which is amazing in and of itself because there were no transmissions of disease from those donors. And that, I have to say, that, that shocks me too. But at any rate, the one thing that the guy had not done in 2005 is he had not gotten American Association of Tissue Banking accreditation. He hadn't gone through that rigorous process. And I will say that in 2005, I think he could have fooled them. But as a result, uh, the AATB has taken pains to make sure that kind of thing could never happen. And as a result, I believe that that's what kind of brings us up to my next slide, which is where we are today. AATB certification, at least on the processor level, is now the price of admission. Most hospital systems will not accept human tissue that is not from an AATB accredited bank. Now, why do I say at least processor? Because the processor is really where the buck, the buck stops here in tissue banking. The processor can take tissue from a recovery agency that's not accredited, but the processor has to audit them to the AATB standards. So the recovery agencies don't need to be accredited, and even your um, even your representatives that come and call on you do not have to be, their, their storage and distribution does not have to be accredited, because for them to even get accredited processing tissue in the door, they have to have been audited by the processor to the standards. And so that has truly become kind of uh, the gold standard today for tissue. And then I'm very happy to say, probably thanks to the internet, uh, those cases where a little girl in one part of the country loses her leg, and a little girl in another part of the country does not, you know, there's still those inequ inequities out there, but the information's available, and by the way, the graphs are available. There are enough graphs out there for every child that would ever have that procedure to get a replacement of the, of the uh, cancerous bone. And then, uh, <laughs> this was a hot topic for years. Everybody said that uh, sports medicine graphs, by the way, I, I call those soft tissue graphs. Uh, those are those hydrogel, natural hydrogel type graphs, uh, cartilage, ligaments, uh, tendons. Um, people were saying for years those could not be sterilized. And now, in almost every case, they are. Unless it's live cells. And there are some fresh knee articular cartilage graphs that have been highly successful uh, through the years. In fact, one surgeon I know has got a patient that's out 35 years now with just a, a fresh graft uh, uh, transplantation. Those still can't be sterilized, but most sports medicine grafts now can be. And then, truly, it really doesn't matter what size or shape of tissue you need, you can find it. And the amazing thing about the processors that, that I work with is that if you can't find it, you can tell them what you need and they'll make it for you. It's pretty amazing what they're able to do. It's almost like a, a, a modern machine shop, for last, lack of a better term. And then uh, something that, that my company's been dealing with, we provide medical direction for uh, eye banks and tissue banks across the country. We've noticed that a lot of the device manufacturers that are right here that make the instruments that our surgeons use, in the old days they used to tell the processor, we want you to manufacture this for us, but you store it and you drop ship it when we need it. And now we're finding that more and more of the agencies are taking their own t their, are taking on their own inventories. They're managing their own inventories. And uh, they feel like it's been able to streamline the process and get their particular tissues out there quicker for transplantation. So what about the future? Well, it's interesting to me that right now, in a number of the uh, tissue products that are out there, we all know there's growth factors in them. Those are biologic factors that might limit inflammation into the surgical wound. They might, you know, they might uh, promote wound healing. And even more importantly, in some cases, increase bone growth and, uh, and the, the transplant itself being taken in by the body. Well, we all know that those come from cells. 
cells. And so in the future, we're not going to be just talking about growth factors. We're going to be talking about the cells themselves. That those cells, and, and some products we already know they're there, but we just don't talk about it. We are also uh, going to see more and more of the combination products that are out there. Right now, a number of uh, agencies release uh, uh, putties and pastes, and they have some kind of a device added to them, and they're almost always some kind of gel device. That was fascinating, Stephen. Some kind of a gel device that helps uh, get, not only get the tissue and get the growth factors into the surgical wound, but maintain enough uh, structure and structural integrity to stay there throughout the healing process. And then, honestly, when everyone finally figures out where FDA is going to land with this, it's going to be stem cells. We are going to see not only are doctors going to be ordering and using uh, tissue, tissue allografts and continue to use those, continue to use device products that become available, but they're also going to use stem cells that are going to restore and regenerate uh, native tissues in the, in the uh, wounded areas. So where do we go from here? From um, my standpoint, it's been, for years I thought that the tissue banks were, were driving everything. It's not, it's not at all the truth now. It is truly what the surgeons are asking for. And a lot of the companies like yours, Stephen, that I find very interesting, are pushing tissue bankers to become even more creative because in, in the long haul they know what they're going to be competing with when it's finally perfected and finally ready. So, and then I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes. If you don't design your own life plan, chances are you'll fall into someone else's plan. Oh yeah. And guess what they have planned for you? Not very much. Any questions?